Hey everybody! Today, Rado runs through Village Attacks, which is a castle defense game where players are trying to fight off hordes of angry villagers. And I'm going to show you how it works in a two-player run-through. Although, before I get going, I strongly recommend you turn your subtitles on to the Klingon channel so that when I make rules goofs, you'll know what they are. And if you've done that, then welcome to the castle, everybody. This is our humble abode. It looks quite lovely. But unfortunately, the local villagers are revolting. They are going to be streaming in through these different spawn points, trying to get to the heart of the castle, where they try to directly damage our life force to wipe us out. Now, in this particular mission I'm playing, it's number six out of 14 missions that come with the base game. It's called Dinner Time. Our castle heart has 17 hit points, and we must protect it above all else. But we have a, another thing we're trying to do. Like I said, it's dinner time, and we are hungry, and so not only can we kill the villagers, we can eat them! And that is because, I might have, maybe I should have led with this, we're not just your normal everyday real estate holders here. We're evil monsters! In this game, I am going to be the Green Banshee, and Jen, my partner over here, my partner in Monster Crime, is going to be the Vampire, who in Village Attacks is kind of like a cleric, really, I guess an undead cleric. So, we are trying to protect our evil domain from these encroachers, and tr in this mission, trying to get a good meal out of it as well. So, to set the game up, I've pretty much done just about everything. You know, the uh, rules tell me how to lay out all the different tiles and all of that. And some places have special things like this is our armory. And so you're supposed to put this little reminder here that there's a special rule. And I also put another reminder here, which is uh, the villagers, when they attack from here, they do plus one point of damage. And this one, why do we have this in our castle? We need a sunroof or something, or we need some umbrellas, because if we end our movement in here, we will burn! So, uh, that's a tricky thing for us to bear in mind. And uh, let's see. So we've got spawn point way up there, over there, and then a special spawn point over here that doesn't spawn um, dur during the normal uh, you know, phase turn situation, but it still can spawn, I think. I have to admit, I'm not quite sure, uh, as is so often the case with really big, complex games like this. They have a lot of thematic trappings tied up in the rules. Sometimes things are a little iffy, and you just kind of have to make your best guess as to how things are supposed to work. But we'll put that aside. I'm not doing final thoughts right now. I'm just trying to show you how the game plays. Right. So we're here in the heart of the castle, and before the game starts, we are supposed to spawn in the uh, normal spawn zones. And you know, sorry off the bat, I'm not 100% certain if this is supposed to spawn, because the rules for dinner time specifically say... Let's see, where is it? Specifically say that... Uh, during the villager phase, you do not spawn villagers in the blue spawn point. However, each time a peasant is delivered to the kitchen, i.e. we eat them, my precious, uh, we immediately spawn a town hero. So that makes it sound like this is a special town hero spawning zone, but it doesn't say anything about whether they should spawn during setup. So I'm just going to assume during setup, because we're not in phase four, uh, I'm going to spawn some stuff here. So first of all, uh, we'll, we'll see what spawns in this neck of the woods. There are some nasty villagers. There should be four of them because right now, at the beginning, we're in tier one. Later on in a mission, things might get more dire, and we're at tier two. That's an event that could happen, which means we spawn more, and maybe even more at tier three. Now, this particular mission, the tiers won't matter. They always stay at tier one. And also in this mission, they will never lose their morale. They have infinite morale. In a lot of the missions, we just have to hold on until we can get, you know, get their morale down to zero, and that stops the horde. But in this one, they'll never stop coming until we complete our objective of eating four of them. Because we're monsters! So anyway, uh, so there should be four villagers here, except as a player scaling element, if you're only having two player monsters, which is the case, the Banshee and the Vampire, there's always supposed to be one less spawn than whatever the card says. So instead of four, there's actually three. If we had three monsters, there would be um, whatever the card said. If there were four or five monsters, because you can have up to five players in this co-op game, there would be even more than what the card says. But as is, there's three over here. Now let's see what spawns over in this neck of the woods. And we've got, ah, hunters. All right, so these are upgraded villagers who cause us a little bit more grief. And they will, they, uh, they, they really have it in for either me or Jen, depending. So instead of three, we're supposed to spawn two of them up there. But we have to find out, have they come to hunt the Banshee? 
or the vampire. And we find that out by drawing in this little uh, bag our tokens representing me and Jen. There's two tokens, so there's a 50 50 chance they've come for me or for Jen. I have no idea which one it'll be. Uh, righty, we just get it randomly here. And all right, they are they have come for the Banshee. So that means I spawn, what was it, two green hunters. They're coming for me. You can see I've got a green base, so do they. That means they prioritize killing me over everything else, uh, which means I'm in a little bit more trouble when they're around. All right, and let's see. Oh, then, like I said, I'm not sure if we're supposed to spawn here. As always, folks, please watch with the Klingon subtitles turned on because Paolo, the guy who checks me for goofs, will have noted if this is incorrect and this is only supposed to be town heroes as part of the normal rules. But for now, I'm going to assume there's some more baddies or good depending on how you call them. All right, three more villagers. All right, let's grab a few more. One, two, three from the big mountain of villagers. And like I said, that could be wrong. I might have just—I might be playing on super hard mode by spawning these extra ones. You just can't be quite certain. But I'm just going to go by what the rules say, and the rules say only during uh, whatever it is, um, the villager phase, this thing doesn't spawn normally. So here we go. They are at our doors. They, we have told them to go away. Uh, we're not interested, but they have decided to persist, and now the game begins. So, on the back page of the rulebook, there's actually a pretty good rule summary of almost everything you need to know. There's a few, like, uh, it really kind of bugs me that there's no reminder of how Nemesis stuff works, and there's a few little things, but for the most part, there's nice charts, and uh, but more importantly, a reminder of the phases of play. First, monsters get to go. Then, villagers go. Then we do some cleanup. How do monsters go? Well, in turn order, starting with me, because we chose me to be the first player, I will roll the six dice and then use them to move, attack, activate abilities, interact with objectives, or place traps. Okay, so... Here's them bones. Let's roll them and see what they give me. No torches, no torches, no torches. Oh, one torch. You never want to see the angry villagers wielding torches. That's never a good thing because that helps them. What this means is one of the villagers on the board is going to get to make a bonus move forward towards our heart. If I had rolled a second one, there would have been two villagers, but as is only one. Is that true? Yes. Under these circumstances, that's going to have to be the case. Because after you've rolled, before you get using any of the dice, or before the torches let the uh, villagers move forward, you might have the opportunity to re-roll. Basically, if um, three or more dice show the same face, you have the option, if you want to, of re-rolling those three or more dice to get something else. So, if I, if, if I had a torch and two other torches, so there were three or more torches, you better believe I'd re-roll them. Now, as it is, I've got one torch, I've got two ranged attacks, two magic, and two, oh, what's it called? Retaliate? Um, yeah. And so, um, I, I don't have three of anything. If this were a third magic instead of a retaliate, and I said, oh, this round I don't want magic, I could re-roll all three of these. Although they'd be risky, because I might re-roll all three of them and create more torches, so that more villagers. So there's always a little bit of push your luck when you re-roll, but under these circumstances, I am not going to be doing it. So, after you've uh, rolled, and you have done any re-rolls that you might decide to do, in this case I'm not going to do any, then we start activating. First, the villagers go, ah, here they come. And I'll just give that because next turn Jen will be using it. So, the um, one villager is supposed to move, and it's supposed to be whichever one is farthest away from the heart. And so, this room is one, two, three away, this room is one, two, three away, this room is one, two, three, four. So it's going to be one of these hunters. He's just gotten a little boost. He's coming for me! I'm coming for you, Banshee! He says. Alright, anyway, that's it. So now, I've still got five dice. You can see why it's a bad thing to roll those torches. Not only do the bad guys get more movement, or I'm sorry, the good guys, I'm going to make that mistake a lot, but uh, it siphons off dice that we could use for our own stuff. So what am I going to do with these dice? Well, first of all, any die face other than a torch, obviously, can be used to move. Uh, and as you can see, I've got three slots here. I could assign up to three dice, regardless of what they say, to move up to three times. The Banshee, she is fast. She is can get around very quickly. The Vampire over here can only move two spaces normally, unless he adopts his bat form. But um, at the beginning of the game, I just have, or, uh, the Vampire has their regular regeneration and not bat form or vampirism. In some of the missions, you actually get to start with a little bit of leveling up going on, but in this mission, we just start out with all the basics. So, 
Um, what am I going to do with these dice? Well, I could move up to three times, but then that means I wouldn't be able to use this as a ranged attack, or this as a ranged attack, or this for magic. What can I do with magic right now? Well, the main thing is, I could deploy my comb trap, which makes a target zone unlucky. Or I could use it for movement. Or I could use it to retaliate or move. I see. So, this guy is off by his lonesome, and I would like to take him out before he causes trouble. So, maybe what I want to do is, I want to use this to shoot at him, but for me to do a ranged attack, and by the way, this is ranged, this is melee. I'd have to be in the room to hit them with a melee, but I can be in an adjacent room and hit them with ranged. So if I want to hit him, I've got to move one, two spaces. So let's say I use two dice, um... Hmm. Actually, if I really want to, I could just... Uh, do I have enough? If I go one, two, one, two, and then... So if I, go, if I use this magic and this retaliate, not for their normal functions, but instead to go one, two, and then I spend this die to go pew! He's taken out. Um, regular low-level villagers and hunters all have just one hit point. So I could take him out. And, uh, yeah, let's just... Let's just eliminate the threat, especially since these guys are coming for me and they might cause me trouble down the road. So I'm going to take a shot. Boom, he's gone. Bye bye And I earned one experience point. Hooray! Now, as you can see, once I get up to five experience points, I'll be able to either get a new power or upgrade, oops, upgrade an existing power. So I want that experience. Oh, yeah. So anyway, I've still got two dice that I haven't used. So I could use this die to move yet again. Hello. And then I had another ranged attack. Kapew! And, I mean, these hunters, they should have stayed home. Because, boom, he's gone. And I've just gotten another experience point. Hooray. Now, normally, in a regular mission, every time you get a kill, not only do you earn experience, but the villager morale drops. Because remember, that's what we're trying to get their morale down to zero, so they will leave us alone. We're just happy little monsters. But in this one, their morale will never drop. This is all about capturing them to um, drag them kicking and screaming all the way down here to the kitchen. This is a special rule you can do in this level. And the rule is, if you're in a room with a villager, you can use a uh, melee attack not to do damage, but instead to literally pick them up, throw them over your back, and then you could start carrying them down to the kitchen. But while you're doing that, you end up having to grab, oh, where is one? Grab a slow token that slows you down. So anyway, I didn't roll any um, melee attacks this time, so I figured, what the heck. With, the, with those two range shots I had, I just figured I was just going to zip over here and take out those guys before they started causing us any problems. All right, so that was it. I have used all three dice. Now, that was just one of many ways I could have gone. Although, probably um, one of the more interesting things uh, that would have been available to me was not available to me because, again, I did not roll any melee strikes. Over here as part of setup, we put out one random trap card. It was Swinging Blades. This is a trap I can install in a corridor. That's what this symbol means. And what if I put that trap in a corridor, um, three damage will be done to um, villagers and hunters. And hunters will be stunned as well. So that'd be really cool. Um, but unfortunately, I couldn't pay the melee strike. I didn't get a melee die to be able to deploy this. So it didn't make any sense. If I could have, it might have made sense for me to come over here, because this is a corridor. This is a corridor. I could have come over here, put the trap down, and it would have sprung when all of these villagers tried to walk in. And I could have taken them out that way. But uh, you know what? we'll see what Jen rolls. Maybe she'll get what she needs to do that. So, I am done. I've used all five of my dice. It is now Jen's turn. Although, if I hadn't used all five of my dice, let's say I hadn't had to move that extra space, let's say. And so, after I was all done, I had one more die. Well, I could have used that to set up a trap, but maybe I had use in the future for magic, and I didn't really want to do it right now. You can always choose to reserve a die. And that means on your next round, you roll one less die because you know what one of your outcomes would be. Actually, what would have made more sense, if I only had to move two, I probably would use these magic because I don't need magic right now. My trap isn't that big. My trap is good going up against ranged guys. I just took out the only two ranged attackers. These are all melee strikers. So my trap, my lucky trap, isn't really that good against melee. So if I'd set this aside, um, I probably, uh, I, I, what I said, I, 
This is a retaliate. I could have set this side um, as defense. And what that means is when the bad guys are going or when the villagers are going, if they struck me, I would have struck back and done an equal amount of damage to them. So, um, you know, or I could save this in reserve, which means it won't be queued up, but maybe I want that for something else. Maybe I wanted, um, you know, a guaranteed melee if I'd rolled that. But anyway, as it is, it doesn't matter. I didn't reserve anything. I didn't do any defense because it didn't make any sense. Instead, I, what was the other one? Oh, I did have the retaliate. I just ran like a banshee. Because again, I'm the fastest. Banshee gets three movement. Uh, I think there's one character who only gets one because he's really slow and big. But anyway, and I took out them and I am done. It is now the vampire's turn. So the vampire gets all six dice. DTT. And you might be saying, wait, 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 wait. Six dice? What about these dice over here? Well, before I go too far, let me remind, there are a lot of optional variants you can add in, depending on whether you got the retail version or the uh, Kickstarter version, I think. like Because I, I, I have troll cards, but I don't actually have a troll mini. We'll put that aside. This is an interesting variant. I'm not going to play with it right now because it adds to the complexity, but it is really cool. It's this notion that sometimes it's nighttime, and sometimes it's daytime. And when it's daytime, we monsters are at a disadvantage. We have to jettison one of our black dice and replace it with this crappy die that's just full of torches. And if we get lucky, at least it's blank. So daytime is bad for us. But nighttime, we get to replace with this one, which is all damage all the time, baby. And so you have to keep track, um, you know, round after round, whether it's day or night. And so I'm just leaving that out. But it is there. It does actually add a little bit more complexity. So anyway, so Jen's just going to roll six normal dice. Oh, the other thing about day and night is um, if you get a kill during a day, you don't get experience, but if you get a kill at night, if I recall correctly, I think you get more experience than normal. So it really makes you strategize a lot more. But we're just playing normal village attacks, and Jen says, what's up? All right, one lousy torch. All righty. Well, no avoiding it. Um, two magic, one defense, another magic, and a melee strike. Now, so Jen's got this choice. Three magic. I mean, Jen can't use magic for nothing. Uh, she has no magic spells that she could cast right now. If she were, if she had bat form, if she had already earned that, she could cast magic to le to turn into a man bat, and then um, get to move two extra spaces, which obviously would be really good when we're carrying these um, uh, villagers down to the the kitchen to get eaten. I assume it's a really big bat to be able to carry them all the way down here. <coughs> so excuse me. So. It doesn't matter. Right now, manage, magic is no good. Neither is, uh, since I don't have a shield, I, I don't matter. I, I have this shield. I can't use it for my vampirism. I could use it to set up defense, which means if, when the villagers go, if they run into me, uh, this will absorb two damage that I might otherwise have to take. Although it's only it, it only interrupts one attack. It doesn't interrupt multiple attacks. So I could save this to defend myself if I think I'm going to be in trouble. Or remember, I can use anything to move. And I did get... A, um, a, what do you call it? I uh, can't think of the word. A uh, uh, melee strike? Which means I could move over to the corridor and set up those swinging blades. Or alternatively, well, that's, that's the problem. I can't move three steps. If I could go one, two, three, I could get into this room and use that melee not to take out this villager, but instead to capture the villager and then start walking south. And if I could do that, since I'd be stuck there, I couldn't move anymore until my next turn, and they would attack me, I would definitely want to set up defense so I wouldn't take as much damage as I try to make my getaway. But as it is, the vampire cannot move that far. So I think it does make sense. Well, but see, I was going to say, I could start using these to move. But remember, I could re-roll these. And if I could re-roll them, maybe I would get more melee strikes, and I could do, uh, do some more fighting. Or I could get some ranged attacks. I mean, if I could get one ranged attack, I could you know, start taking out guys from a distance. But every time I re-roll, I might get more torches. And I don't like those odds. So I think Jen's just going to live with what she's got. And by the way, if you get three torches, you can re-roll those too. Sometimes you can get like a whole series, a string of roll and re-roll and re-roll, um, because you just keep getting triples or quadruples. Anyway, I'm just going to live with this. I don't want to run the risk. So, before I get to do anything, the bad guys, the villagers start coming. And now we have a tricky situation. These villagers and these villagers are equidistant from the heart. There will often be times when you have to make decisions for the villagers and um, you know, be, and there's no clear winner. In this case, what whenever you have a situation where there's, you know, it could be this group or this group, they're equidistant, you bring out the coin. You flip it. You decide, okay, those ones are heads, those ones are tails. You flip the coin... 
and it's Tails. So it's one of these villagers who moved up. You I will find yourself flipping that coin to answer questions like, which one should the villager attack? And stuff like that. Quite a bit, actually. Or, you know, sometimes on some maps, there's like multiple paths they could take, etc., etc. So one villager has separated from his group. He was uh, Mr. Eager over there. And now, Jen can get going. Let's see. I think Jen will use the two magic to move as far as she can. One, two... And she will use her melee to buy this uh, trap just to shut those guys down. Now, she doesn't um, have to. I mean, we could save that for later. But, you know, it's good just to keep things under control. Um, but, you know, and, you know, these guys, there won't be anybody else spawning down here. So we could start trying to capture and harvest these guys later. Because, hey, they're closer to the... Um, to the kitchen. Trying to pick these ones up and drag them all this way makes less sense than trying to grab these guys and drag them down. So, she is going to go on ahead and spend that melee. And let's see. So that means she's still got two dice. She's still got two dice. She can't move anymore. She might as well go on ahead and reserve this for defense. I don't think it's really going to matter too much because those swinging blades are going to take care of everything. But, you know, if there were more players, there might have been more villagers who, you know, something could have happened. And then she's still got this one last die. She can go on ahead and reserve it if she wants to, but she's not going to because she does. She, magic isn't particularly interesting to her. If she had her bat form, she probably would reserve this so that she could use her bat form next turn, guaranteed. So she's not going to use that for anything. She's um, reserving one. And now, when you reserve a die, what happens is you got to give all six dies to the next player. So what you do is you say, oh, I reserved that action, and there's all these little uh, markers representing them. So we just put this over here to say, next round, Jen is only going to roll five dice if this is still here. Uh, I'm sorry, no, no, that's if it's in the reserve. This is, I mean, she's using this die if she were to get attacked. She's not going to get attacked, um, but you, you never know. You know, uh, events and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. So, okay. All right, so Jen is done, and we have finished the monster phase. Now, let's go back to the rule summary. After the monster phase, we go to the villager phase. Advance the event wheel and draw an event if needed. And then starting with zones closest to the castle heart, villagers attack and then move. That's very important order. Uh, and then traps trigger. And then we spawn new villagers and then we do cleanup. So, events. Uh, in addition to the castle heart life meter over here and the villager morale, which doesn't matter, it's infinite, there is an event. Because we're playing with two monsters, we move up twice. One, two. If we were playing with four monsters, we would go up four. Um, if I recall correctly, I'm pretty sure that's right. And this particular mission says that I think when we get to five, an event is going to happen. Is that what it was? Right. Events trigger on 5, 10, 15, and 19. And events are generally bad things that you don't want to see happen. Uh, it seems like we can't catch a break, we monsters. But anyway, so, no event has happened yet. All right, so we started out and went one, two. And now it is villager time. So, we go for the villager who's closest. This is the closest villager, because he's got one, two. First of all, if there were anybody available for him to attack, he would attack. Now, villagers have a range of zero. They do not know how to fire a gun or a crossbow or anything, so they can only attack somebody who's with them. The hunters, remember I took those hunters out, they can actually attack from an adjacent room. That's why I wanted to get them out of the way so quick. And the town heroes, the kind of the boss, I was going to say boss monsters, but the boss villagers, they're, well, they're really bad news. We don't want to see any of them if we can avoid it. Anyway, so he wants to attack, he can't, there's nobody here. So instead, he will, and, and after he's done attacking, he will move. He's getting closer to our heart. All right, and now we have the next group. And now these guys are equal distant. And strictly speaking, I suppose I should flip form, but it doesn't, it's not going to matter or anything. These guys move up, and these three move up. And after all the attacks and movement are, you know, and by the way, they couldn't attack, so they moved. These ones couldn't attack, so they moved. And now, after all the attacking movement is done, if there are any villagers in a room with a trap, the trap is sprung. Kapling! Swinging blades. Deal three damage, and hunters are stunned. This hurts villagers and hunters, so all three of these are kabling taken out. Bye bye Good night. You should have stayed at home. And the trap is gone. Now, unfortunately, we don't get experience for that. It would be great to get three experience points. Boom, boom, boom. But if morale mattered, we still would have gotten to drop the villager morale for those kills. But um, traps don't earn you experience. But hey, we've cleared out an entire area. There's only um, three left on the board. We can start trying to capture them and drag them down against their will to eat them because they uh, look very juicy. 
Let's see. So um, now we spawn new villagers. So it's at this point that only the red and the red are going to spawn. For, uh, the blue is not going to spawn unless some special event happens, like us dragging somebody to the kitchen. So let's see what this room gives us now. It. What was I? <laughs> hey, it's a boss. Okay. So um, we are going to have one boss. And you know, this is something I've never really 100 clear about. Um, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I mean, these symbols. Yeah, there's so much in this game, but I'm pretty sure it means we have one boss. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it's telling us flip a card, look at a boss. All right, so we're gonna flip a card, see what boss we get, and it is the executioner, who is the yellow boss. The yellow boss has shown up over here, and now neither of us, uh, you know, Jen is the blue player, I'm the green player. So the executioner is not our nemesis. He is not going to hunt us down and try to defeat us above all else. But he's still bad news because he has eight hit points. He's slow. He only moves once, but he does three points of damage. So we've really got to take care of him because he's going to slowly work his way up here, and then he's just going to start whiling away, you know, just smacking down our heart. And potentially kill us. So that's what spawned over here. Let's see what spawned over there. We have got a uh, some more hunters. Okay, one hunter this time because we uh, reduce it by one since we're playing two. And again, we have to see if it's uh, a banshee or a vampire hunter. All right, and we have it's me. They're all coming after me. So we get another one. We should really close that door. That, that is just not good. Uh, somebody's letting a draft in. Okay, so another hunter has come to avenge his fallen hunter friends. But you came looking for me, you will regret that, says the Banshee in a much more menacing way than I just did. Okay, so we have finished uh, all the villager stuff. We spawned and now clean up. Um, if there were any tokens because of events like, you know, if, if places got dark or, um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, all right, and... Um, all right. Oh, one new trap comes out. There's always one new trap that comes out. So over time, we might, if we don't use these traps immediately, they might build up and give us a lot of flexibility. Um, right. So crushing walls is our next trap. We need to use a shield die to place it. It can go in a corridor or a small room, not a large room. It it doesn't take out heroes, but it does four damage. And um, any villagers who weren't crushed by that four damage immediately advance one because they rush out like Indiana Jones because they survived. Okay. So that is our new one we have and. Jen will be the first player. So effectively, in a two-player game, Jen is going to get two turns in a row. And that is it, folks. We have finished one round of Village Attacks. That should give you a pretty good idea of the basics of the game. But if you'd like to watch a little bit more, you can hit that I in the top right corner screen, go to the extended playthrough, or set and go straight to Final Thoughts. Your choice in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1.